Good morning and welcome to the first part of today's mobile digital briefing. Um, I've already been introduced, but my name is Kirsty. I'm from the Norway office and I work mainly in the I work in the business development team and mainly with projects around digital strategy. Um, my background is also from Accenture in business strategy in London and um, also some marketing strategy in Telenor, Oslo and Global. And then for the last three years, I've been also running my own e-commerce business here in Oslo. So um, hopefully I can give you the sort of high level strategic point of view when it comes to digital, but also an operational and hands on point of view because I've um, experienced that myself. Um, but today I'm here to talk to you about mobile and introduce uh, the topic of mobile internet through the big trends and hopefully demonstrate to you the impact um, that this can have on your business, but more to the point, the, the huge opportunity that this channel offers um, through illustrating the big numbers. So um, it's a bit of a scene setter before the guys behind me come in and um, go into more detail. So when, um, just to get started, um, when most of us think about mobile um, and the mobile telephone, we probably still default to the association that it's um, our core communication tool. It's what we, we think of to text, it's what we think of to talk. Um, and when we think about uh, the internet and going online, we probably still default to the top of mind association, which is like the PC or the laptop. So for the average person in the mainstream, the world today, when we think about online and the internet, probably looks something like this in terms of proportion. So, um, but before we go any further, I just want to ask you all a question, and this is a bit of a, a risky experiment. Um, we've already done this presentation in uh, Copenhagen and Stockholm, and it worked in Copenhagen, and it didn't work in Stockholm, so <laughs> I'm just going to cross my fingers. Um, just by show of hands, how many people have been on their computers this morning? That's quite a lot. Um, and then again, by show of hands, how many people have checked their email this morning? So I think it's fair to say that more people have checked their email than they have, um, than have been on their computer. And um, that's great because that's what's meant to happen. <laughs> um, so although maybe the world in our heads looks like this, in actual fact, um, just by as has been demonstrated in the room today, there's a change happening. And, um, and whether it's um, conscious or subconscious, the mobile phone is beginning to have a much more dominant role in our lives, and particularly when it comes to going online. So the world is maybe changing from the previous slide to look something like this. And this shift is being catalyzed by um, new technology, technology that we're probably all in this room very familiar with. It's your smartphone and it's your iPhone, and it's these types of technologies that are changing the behavior of the mobile phone user. So when we look at the numbers, um, these numbers also confirm that um, 100, over 130 million um, iDevices have cumulatively been distributed throughout the world at the moment. And this number is probably already out of date and it is actually fairly new. Um, and when we say iDevices, we mean your iPhone, we mean iPad, we mean iTouch, iPod. Um, there's all, all those, those um, devices. And this number doesn't even take into account smartphones. And there's lots of smartphones and Android phones, etc., all throughout um, the different operators. So if we added that number on top of this 130 million, I'm sure it would explode. Um, um, unfortunately, we don't have it, but it, it's going to be a lot bigger than this. There's also um, forecasted to be over 50% of the Norwegian population deemed to own a smartphone already, which is um, a phenomenal number and outstrips many of the countries throughout Europe. So this is a really important number. And 70 to 100,000 uh, iPads were also deemed to be in circulation before the launch, just in Norway which um, is quite phenomenal. And we all know that it launched last week because there's so much hype in all the media and all the, the newspapers, and we don't have numbers of the, the sales yet, but we could maybe assume that this number has already doubled since um, the interest is so high. But um, what these numbers together um, start to tell us is that the adoption rate of these new technologies and interest in these new technologies is, is extremely high. And as a result, it's changing the user behavior of the mobile phone. And the smartphone user, particularly throughout Scandinavia, by the numbers we've just seen, is a particularly uh, sophisticated mobile phone user and um, is becoming more sophisticated by the minute. And um, these numbers by Forrester help confirm uh, this trend and this change in user behavior. When um, it's, it's, the screen's not very bright, but hopefully you can see it. Um, when Forrester, and this is fairly uh, new numbers, quarter two, 2010, 
Um, when Forrester asked all mobile phone users throughout Europe what activities they used uh, mostly on their mobile phones, um, we see the results something like this. So at, top, at the top, you still see the, the most traditional activities such as SMS and probably MMS, and, um, and you probably have talk in there as well if that was part of the equation. But when we add in the iPhone, we see that this completely changes uh, the user behavior of, of people who use their mobile phone. Um, and when we reference iPhone throughout these presentations, we're also um, referencing the smartphone. It's just that we don't have statistics that splits them up. Um, so the iPhone, um, not only is it an enabler for people to go online a lot more easy, uh, easily, and you see there that the numbers are 85% of people with an iPhone will go online versus just the standard average mobile phone user is only 9%. Um, so it, it lets us go online a lot easier, probably because of the better user experience. But actually, um, in general, the iPhone and this new smartphone technology has completely revolutionized the way we use the mobile phone. And in fact, it's, it's increased our usage across even the standard, um, sort of more traditional services. So we even SMS more through this type of technology. So it's had a huge impact on um, the way we just use the standard mobile phone. So we're... Um, it used to be that the mobile phone was our core communication tool. It maybe helps us get up in the morning with the alarm clock and organize our day through uh, the diary, for example. It's, a lot, it's now um, a lot more than that. It helps us control our lives. We can pay our parking tickets through SMS. We can consume all sorts of media, which I'm sure you're all quite familiar with. Um, we can even create our own content, and then we have the opportunity to share that throughout social media. So um, we're at one point, um, not that long ago, um, digital giants and the industry would reference the mobile phone as maybe being a, a part-time PC experience. It's even uh, surpassed that now. And um, I think it's more like a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week digital assistant. And for some of us, I think we'd feel um, quite naked and lost if we didn't have our mobile phone because we've come, become really dependent on it. It's almost like a, another child. If you, if you lose it, you're, you're very upset. <laughs> so um, I think in the, uh, in the last 10 years, we can definitely confirm, can confirm that um, the mobile phone has changed the way we communicate and live. But with um, giants such as Google making statements as bold as this, that by 2013, there's going to be more people online via their mobile phone than via the fixed PC, we can probably confirm that um, over the next 10 years, uh, the mobile phone and mobile internet is going to have a huge impact on the way we do business. So it's really smart of us all to be here today to try and learn some more about the subject because I think it's, it's going to be a huge opportunity for us as um, businesses. But before I go any further, and um, this is us, uh, sort of, that was the sort of little context setter of uh, mobile, mobile internet. Now we're going to jump into some of the big trends. Um, and before I go any further, I just want to ask the question if anyone knows, and I'm sure somebody does, um, what these three luxury items have in common. So we've got the $150,000 sports car, we've got the $120,000 speedboat, and then we've got the Bentley car. Does anybody know? Okay. Um, well, the fact is that they've all been bought on eBay, and uh, they've all been bought on eBay by people through their mobile phones. So it takes the idea of impulse purchasing to a whole new level. And um, but it also illustrates that um, there's money to be made, and money to be made in this new trend, which is called m-commerce. And that's the trend we're going to talk about now. Um, so, in fact, um, over 10 million people purchased uh, tangible goods via their mobile phone on eBay last year in 2009. And we say tangible goods because there was a trend before that that um, people were buying ringtones and downloading music and things like this. But this is products, um, which is a new phenomenon. And then by the last quarter in 2009, it was um, at such a rate that eBay were selling uh, products via their mobile phone platform every two seconds. So for those of us that work in retail, it's um, a really phenomenal figure and one that we can only be jealous of because they're definitely doing something right. So it's no surprise that by the end of 2009, so last year, eBay reported $600 million worth of revenue just through their mobile phone platform and that they're doing so well. By the end of this year, they pred predict that they're going to have um, achieved $1.5 in terms of turnover just through their mobile phone platform. So um, they're not the only ones. Obviously, uh, eBay are at the forefront of uh, e-commerce, so it's no surprise that they're also at the forefront of m-commerce. 
Um, but Amazon, they're also doing very well in the topic of m-commerce and are on track to reach uh, 1 billion by the end of 2010. So um, they're doing really well. And um, now we're just going to try and understand a little bit more of why they're doing well. And we're going to watch a movie. Um, it's quite a long movie. It's about two minutes. So um, just sit back and relax and have a drink of water. I hope this is going to work. Um, I'm going to try and link up here. Um, I don't know if we've got sound, actually. Hi, I'm Karen Bard, eBay trend expert. And I'm here to tell you about our latest shopping app, eBay Fashion. Now you can have instant access to the world's largest fashion marketplace in the palm of your hand. Can anyone hear that? With this app, savvy shopping has never been easier. Simply open the application and you can start window shopping right away. From the home screen, you can check out our virtual style gallery showcasing the latest trends. When you see something you like, simply tap on the picture and you can browse similar items. You can also access eBay's popular fashion vault for exclusive, limited time sales on coveted designer brands. If you have an idea of what you're looking for, you can browse through popular categories. You can even shop vintage by decade. I need a new pair of skinny jeans and a cute pair of ballet flats. If I tap on the women's category, then clothing, then jeans, I have instant access to the best deals on denim around. From here, I can narrow down my search with just a few taps. Once I see the pair of jeans I like, I can either watch, bid, buy, or start building my perfect outfit in the virtual closet by tapping on the heart icon. Of course, if I already know what I'm looking for, I can easily search for a specific item, like Tory Burch flats. I start typing Tory Burch and eBay automatically recognizes popular searches similar to mine and fills out the rest of the term for me. Another cool new feature is how you can browse through multiple listings in gallery view, simply by tapping the arrows below. You can also scroll through multiple pics and get details by tapping on the i button. From here, you can share the listing on email, Facebook, or Twitter. And if you're ready to purchase, simply tap bid or buy. Once I have my favorite item selected, I can start building my outfits here in the closet and virtually try stuff on. I have the option to build my outfit on a white background or by using a picture of myself in my library or taking one from my camera. I simply drag my item into the window and see how my outfit's coming together. I can resize the images, remove the background color, or even superimpose the items on a picture of myself to see how they would look. Once I'm happy with my perfect outfit, I tap on save so I can go back to it or I can share it with my friends through email to get a second opinion. Pretty cool, isn't it? With eBay's fashion app, you can build your wardrobe and discover your personal style at a fraction of the cost. So that's eBay and they're um, doing really well at M-Commerce for um, some of these reasons. Um, I'm just going to try and get the presentation back. <laughs> Here we go. Um, so they, um, they have uh, been really successful in optimizing the um, web experience, the, the big screen experience onto the small screen. Everything's optimized for the small screen, whether it's navigation, search, um, they've got call to actions all the way through the process, and they've got um, the opportunity to spread it out through social network and share it with friends, etc. So these are some of the really uh, huge key success, success factors in what they've done um, in e-commerce. But what's also really important to understand is that these uh, platforms along the bottom, they've also optimized their app for each one of these different platforms. So whether you have an Android phone, a smartphone, an iPad, or an iPhone, um, eBay uh, application is optimized to each one of these platforms, which means it has huge reach, and, and it's all in the customer's terms, when they want, how they want, in the way that they want. So that's um, one of the reasons they're doing extremely well. But when we bring this trend of e-commerce more local and we look at the Scandinavian market, we can see that the numbers um, uh, are actually, they're quite small, but they are there. So when people have been asked um, how many of them have shopped online through their mobile at the moment, we see numbers like this. So about an average of 4% throughout Scandinavia. Um, so still quite small. 
But then um, when we ask them how many are willing to shop online through their mobile um, online, we see that the numbers jump quite significantly and it illustrates that there is an opportunity. So there's demand there um, and there's not necessarily supply. So maybe the difference between um, the number of people shopping online through their mobile and the number of people who want to shop online through their mobile is the fact that the uh, companies out there aren't necessarily supplying the applications in the way and the format that uh, consumers are maybe demanding in order for them to feel secure uh, in order to shop online. So that's one takeaway from this slide. The other um, point to remember though is that um, throughout the world this trend is still quite niche and Forrester actually predict that um, you know, direct revenues from m-commerce at the moment are still quite limited. So um, it's there and it's growing um, but it's maybe not um, hit the mainstream yet. So um, while we wait for e-commerce um, to mature and maybe um, become more mainstream, there's lots of other ways that we can exploit the mobile channel in order to engage and build loyalty with our consumers. And one of those is the trend of applications, which I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Um, the trend or the name applications is now almost second nature for us, which is quite phenomenal since the term itself was gen uh, launched only two years ago. Um, this graph's a little bit difficult to see, but at the bottom corner there in the left-hand side, it's uh, July 2008, and the top right-hand corner is today. Um, so in a period of two years, um, there's been three, there's now 300,000 uh, applications available in the iTunes Apple Store. And in that two years, there's been um, seven billion downloads. So what's, what that tells us um, as businesses is that this... Uh, trend of applications has been adopted quite significantly by uh, the average person and it's integrated quite heavily into our lifestyles whether we realize it or not. And if you think about it yourself, um, what applications you use throughout the day, maybe you don't even realize that you're using applications. But you might have woke up this morning to uh, your alarm clock on your iPhone, which is an application. Um, and you might have uh, checked your email on your iPad, which is also an application. You might have checked Facebook, got a uh, status on Twitter. You might have checked the New York Times. They're all applications. You might have listened to uh, a podcast on the way to work um, in your commute, which is an application. And then maybe while you're at work, you might have uh, you know, needed to get directions to go to a meeting, which um, maybe looked up Google Maps. So these are all applications. Um, so whether you realize it or not, it's, it's, it's a, there's been a high adoption rate and, and it's fairly integrated into our lifestyles. Um, and this new trend of uh, mobile phone behavior and user behavior has led to some giants in the industry such as Wired making uh, bold statements like this. They forecast that in the future the web is dead, uh, the traditional World Wide Web. And, um, it's quite a bold statement. Some people agree with it, some people don't. But uh, what they're referencing here is that more and more um, we're downloading applications from uh, the App Store to our mobile phone. And these um, are shortcuts to things that we want to get done throughout our daily day. So this could be you know, our favorite airline, this could be our favorite recipes, it could be our favorite supermarket. We might have a couple of games in there. We might even have a bank application. So what this tells us is that there's less and less need for us to go into the big browser in a traditional sense and type www dot um, in order to try and find and, and do what we need to do. So um, this is good news and bad news, um, depending on how you look at it. For the companies um, that do it right, this is really good news. Because um, although we maybe have uh, hundreds of apps on our iPhone, we maybe only have... Um, room in our lives for 10, 10 applications that we use, that we rely on, that we use every day. So if you're a company that manages to get your app into these 10 that are used every day, then this is a phenomenal opportunity because you have a clear competitive advantage and you can start building loyalty with your consumer base. Because if you solve your uh, user's problem, you know, if they want to book a flight, and uh, they can do this really quickly, efficiently, and they have a good experience through the app that you provide, then they're going to continue to use your app and not go to a competitor. And then you're building brand loyalty very quickly. So it's, it's really good for those that manage to do it right, um, and it just illustrates that there's a big opportunity. But what we also have to remember, um, if this works. Oh, there we go. No, we're not. There we go. 
is that um, actually uh, when Forrester um, uh, asked the whole of Europe, and again, the average mobile phone user, which is the pink bar, um, how many of them download apps on, uh, on a monthly basis, we see that the, the average numbers, for, again, for the mainstream is still quite limited. It's, it's an average of 4% throughout Europe say that they do this on a monthly basis. And when we look at Sweden in particular, and we'll assume that Sweden is representative of the whole of Scandinavia, we see the numbers jump quite significantly. So again, it tells us that the mobile phone user in Scandinavia is slightly more advanced than the rest of Europe. But um, when we uh, think about the 17%, and if we remember back to the number, which was 50% of Norway um, potentially uh, owns a smartphone, that's still only about 9% of the population who download apps. So just bear that number in mind when you're seeing in the media that every company seems to be launching an app, and we need to launch an app. And um, the point is, don't panic. And um, you should definitely consider this opportunity because there's a lot of uh, business benefit to, ha to be had here. But our main takeaway from this is that you should do it based on insight. So you need to understand who your customers are. You need to understand their mobile phone behavior and then build your solution based on that. And what we mean here is um, this is a model by Forrester again. And um, it's, uh, it's called the Technographics Tool. And they aim to profile their, customer uh, their customers, uh, the mobile phone user, by their mobile phone sophistication. So the bottom of the ladder is uh, low mobile phone sophistication and the top is high. So it starts by um, you know, even the person who doesn't own a mobile phone and then it moves up the ladder to someone who just uses it for talking, who uses it for uh, SMS, MMS, and then it goes up in sophistication to the very top user who is the super connected. And they are the heaviest user of all mobile phone activities and they use the most advanced features. So it's probably the top of the ladder that use uh, apps on a regular basis. And what you have to remember here is that um, this group of uh, customers are also the most, um, well, they're most advanced, but they're also the most experienced. So they'll have tested and used and tried lots of different apps. So they will also be the first to dismiss your app if it's not good enough. Um, so that's just an interesting point to bear in mind. But when you try to size your uh, mobile phone users and then micro-segment them into these different uh, sections of the ladder, you might find, like the rest of Europe, that the majority of your users uh, fall into the bottom of the ladder um, because they're still actually quite a basic mobile phone user. When we look at Sweden, we see it changes slightly again and the numbers start to fill out in the top of the ladder, which again illustrates um, that there's more opportunity to do techno, you know, sort of more jazzy, technologically advanced um, applications with this market. Um, but again, um, every company uh, has a different type of profile as their target audience. So the most important thing is to try and understand their mobile phone usage, their mobile phone sophistication, and then try and size them accordingly. Because if your uh, customer base ends up in the bottom half of the ladder, then you have to do something else than uh, a really sophisticated app because they won't even know it. it exists and they won't download it and they won't use it and then that will be a waste of money. So um, this is one example from BMW um, who used the mobile phone channel in a really clever way in order to engage with their audience um, who were a different profile. They used an MMS campaign um, to target, um, um, which was built around uh, winter tires. So just like Scandinavia, when it hits the winter months, in Germany, uh, most people have to change their tires to winter tires. So BMW um, made the most of their database. They drilled into their uh, archives and they understood that their customers, um, they could um, establish which models of car their customers had. They could understand what color of car they had. They, uh, they could understand when they last bought winter tires. So they had all this great information. And what they did is they superimposed pictures of um, the tires, the new winter tires, onto the exact model of each individual customer's car. And they waited until uh, the first day of winter, and then they pushed out this MMS campaign to their customers. And it was really, really successful because um, it was really relevant. It was snowing outside and they needed uh, to start thinking about winter tires. Um, so the timing was perfect. It was really, really personal um, because it was their car, their model, their color. So it was really successful. And the numbers um, also proved the success. They sent out 117,000 MMS picture messages and they had a conversion rate of 30%, which meant 35,000 of the customers that um, received this message went to their BMW dealership and inquired about winter tires. 
The whole campaign only cost um, only cost BMW $60,000, which is quite good in terms of you know, probably their, their, the scale of their marketing budget. On average, the customer spent about $1,300, which meant a return of investment per customer of 758. Um, but the most phenomenal number of all is the bottom one, which is a new business of $45 million. So it just shows you that um, there's lots of different ways to use the mobile channel in marketing campaigns, and you just have to do it with um, time-specific, relevant, and personal to your customer base. So, um, so far we've talked about some of the uh, big trends. We've looked at e-commerce and we've looked at applications. Um, and then we've discussed the technology behind it. Um, but we're moving on to one of the biggest trends of all of the, last, uh, of the recent years. And it's uh, a trend that we're all still trying to get our head around because it's kind of just arrived and we've all adopted it and we don't really know why, it's just here. <laughs> and it's that of social media. And um, it has a really close relationship with mobile, so it's a really interesting uh, topic to discuss. And most of the social media trend can be credited to this guy, and I'm sure you've all seen him in the media uh, recently. I uh, can't really see him there, but it's Mark Zuckerberg. He's the 26-year-old founder um, of Facebook, the world's largest uh, social community site. Um, he's a Harvard graduate, and he's uh, smiling because in the last couple of weeks, his uh, business has been valued at $41 billion, which is not bad for a 26-year-old uh, university graduate. <laughs> um, He's also smiling because uh, across the world, he's got over 500 million uh, users uh, actively using Facebook, which is a great achievement as well. And um, what's really interesting to, do to today's context is that 150 million of those uh, active Facebook users are doing it through their mobile phones. Um, and what uh, people are starting to find out is that uh, those users who uh, use social media through their mobile phones are twice as active as those who access social media through the fixed PC or de the desktop PC or laptop. And we can see that because they actually spend on average 10 minutes more per day um, on Facebook through their mobile phone than those people who access Facebook through their PC. So there's this love affair between mobile and social which um, isn't going to go away. It's a really powerful um, convergence and it's going to only get stronger. And then when we look at um, beyond Facebook, because there's a lot more social media out there than just Facebook, we start to see um, statistics like this from the UK, which are, are quite scary, actually, because it states that almost a quarter of our time that we spend online, or the people in the UK, anyway, spend online, um, is spent in social media, some form of, of so social media. So we've got this completely new behavior, which um, has been adopted because of uh, social communities and, and networks. And one in four of these people who spend a quarter of their time online in social media do it from their mobile phone. So again, it confirms that this trend between mobile and social is really, really strong. And um, it's, it's definitely not going to go away. But when we add in another component to the mix, which is location, we get this extremely powerful conversion called, uh, which is between mobile location and social. And this trend is uh, one of the biggest trends of all and one that we should all talk, uh, think about in detail because it, although it's at the beginning stages, certainly in Scandinavia, it's going to offer businesses in the future um, huge opportunities if, if we can all get it right. And when we talk about um, location, we uh, start to think about applications which are the, such as Govala and Foursquare. And I'm not sure how many people are familiar and actually use this, so I'm just going to check um, how many people have checked in here today, uh, if the internet works. Okay, so we've got eight people, um, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that maybe 50% of that's Karuna, so, um, the IT geeks here. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's, that's kind of representative of the rest of the market. If you see there, it says 1% um, of the US, this is based in the US, um, are using uh, Foursquare at the moment. So, so that um, eight people that have checked in today in this room is kind of representative. It's still very much a niche activity. But what we refer to here um, with uh, location-based services is this example up here is Foursquare. And what it does is it's an application on your mobile phone um, it allows you to check into locations, so we've checked into this building today. It registers your coordinates, so you know, your exact, can pinpoint your exact location. And you can tell your friends that you've checked in here and you're at the Karuna Digital Mobile Briefing. Um, you can also look to um, who's checked in here before and see if they've got any ratings and reviews. 
Um, and because your location's been registered, you can look to the surrounding area, to shops, bars, restaurants, etc., and see if there's any special offers or promotions available um, uh, because you're at this location. So it's actually been designed as a type of loyalty program, or that's the theory behind it. Eventually, um, uh, businesses will be able to communicate and engage with their consum uh, consumers and give them almost um, instant rewards. And if they're at a nearby location, try and incentivize them to move over to their location and, and spend their money there instead. So that's kind of the theory behind it. Um, but in actual fact, the way it's being used at the moment with this low proportion of uptake is it's, it's a bit of a social game for adults. And there's two parts to it. One part of it is it's a bit of a bragging tool. You want to show off to your friends. You want to tell them that you've checked into this gourmet restaurant in Oslo. And, um, and this is my lifestyle. And I'm so fabulous. And look at me. I'm great. So there's that element to it. Um, so it's a bit of a social game like that. And the other part of the social game is uh, a bit of, I think, a man thing. And it's about um, marking your territory. And uh, it's if you check into uh, a location enough, um, you can become the mayor of this location. And um, there's no incentive at all. Like, you don't get any money back. You don't get any gift vouchers or anything like that. It's just ego, which is why I think it's a man thing. <laughs> and, um, for example, my husband's uh, uh, competing with the neighbor above our apartment to become the mayor of our apartment block. And, uh, and it's really addictive, and it's uh, really competitive. And um, actually, he just won it this week, so he's really proud. And it's, uh, it's really pointless. <laughs> um, but lots of people do it, and um, more and more people are doing it. And I think once there's more uptake, um, it'll change into this more loyalty program where we can start integrating it into our businesses and mobile strategies. And um, one example of this, of, uh, again from the US, where it's, it's actually been tested out and from a business perspective is um, McDonald's. And um, they did a, launched a one-day Foursquare campaign where they um, <coughs> spread out $5 and $10 vouchers through the Foursquare network. They leaked the campaign out so people knew it had uh, launched. And it, this told people that they could go to their nearest McDonald's restaurant and uh, check in, sort of register their coordinates. I'm here. Tell their friends <laughs> that they're there. And uh, some lucky winner, uh, or 100 lucky winners, would uh, then receive a message on their phone saying, congratulations, you've won a $5 voucher for McDonald's. So they could then take that message on their mobile phone screen up to the cash register and say, can I have my $5 worth of cheeseburgers? And that's the way it worked. Um, actually, McDonald's, it got picked up by the PR, it spread across Facebook, everything. So it had a phenomenal impact. And they uh, managed to increase the footfall to the restaurants by 33%. And the whole campaign only cost McDonald's $1,000 to uh, design and establish and launch. So um, for a company that spends billions of dollars in marketing spend, this had a, a really phenomenal impact. And we don't have um, statistics on... Uh, the, the sales uplift, but we can probably assume that most people who step into a McDonald's restaurant will buy a cheeseburger. So I'm sure it did also impact sales. So it's a really interesting example to show um, if you have the right mechanic and the right message, you can really get some competitive spirit going amongst um, the consumers and, and get some benefit. So that's um, a little bit about the convergence of uh, social, mobile, and location. And what lends on quite uh, leads on quite nice to that is the topic of mobile search. And this is uh, us coming to the end of the, the presentation, but this is quite an interesting topic when you think about it. Um, what's been discovered is the smartphone user, so the iPhone user and the smartphone user and the Android user, all this, um, they're actually heavier users of mobile search. And the behavior is changing in terms of searching. So we're all used to going into Google, into the big browser, and typing and searching. And, and you know, we're all quite good at it now. But when you're using your mobile phone, you're generally out and about, and you're trying to find information about something now. So the behavior has changed. Not only is it a small screen, so you're a lot more shorthand in your searches, but you're also uh, reference location quite a lot because you need an answer now. So you might be. Um, in Soli Place looking for a gourmet sushi restaurant in Soli Place. And you might get Alex Sushi, for example. Um, but only if Alex Sushi have a, um, a localized search strategy for their mobile phones. So um, what this tells us is that um, 
we need to start thinking differently as businesses. The impact is that maybe we do need to localise our search strategy so that we can be found and changed to this new uh, behaviour of uh, mobile phone users. Because a third um, of, this is research from the UK again, it's been discovered that a third of all searches done on the mobile phone is looking for a location that's local. So again, that confirms that this, this trend is coming and, and we need to start thinking about it so that we can be found. Um, and actually 11.5% of people um, are using their mobile phone to search before they go shopping. So again, it's this new behavior um, and we need to start thinking about it. But the biggest number of all is 38%. Um, and this number is the number of people that are using their mobile phone to shop while they're in an actual store. So um, this lends to another trend which uh, uh, it's called contextual marketing. And what it means is that people are becoming more open-minded to receive messages from companies while they're in a physical store looking for their, their products or whatever. So they're open to um, receive messages on their phone. It's not spam anymore, provided it's in the right context and it's relevant to their current situation. So, um, and we can see that from these numbers again, the, the top one, when asked how, uh, what people are using mobile search for, we see that a lot of it's still to find location-based information. That's the top one. But most of them underneath, from the, top, the second one all the way down, is um, telling us that people are open to receive coupons, gift vouchers, instant rewards, um, while they're in a store shopping. So again, you can, uh, once you know a, a customer, maybe they'll check into your... Uh, whether it's you know, a, a retail store or a restaurant or a bar or even an airport, you can then um, flash up uh, some communication that gives them a real-time benefit, um, which only lasts while they're in your store. When they step outside of your store and their uh, location is lost, that offer will disappear. So it's all about um, giving them uh, instant reward and trying to convert uh, them to sale immediately while in their store. And you can see the blue number there is uh, Sweden, and again, representative, hopefully, for the whole of Scandinavia. And we see that 15% of uh, uh, mobile phone users are open to this, which is quite a big number. And I'm sure it's just going to grow as the adoption rates of all these technologies increases. And one company um, which really understood the way their consumers were using mobile phones to research and, um, while they were shopping was Sephora. Um, for those of you who are not sure about um, Sephora, they're a cosmetic and beauty chain throughout Europe. And um, what they did is they launched an app um, which gave their consumers real-time um, uh, peer uh, user-generated uh, uh, ratings and reviews. So while their uh, customers were at point of sale and they were wondering where to buy this product or this product, they could go onto this app and, and see what other people have um, said about it and their experiences and whether it was good or bad. So they were quite exposed. Um, but what they did is they really managed to c convince people at point of sale to um, hopefully convert um, and con convert to sale. And it was a really successful campaign. Again, we don't have... Um, the revenue figures for it, but um, it's been discussed quite positively throughout the digital world, so it's a really uh, good example. An extension of this is at the bottom, um, what we've just discussed, you can then take this to another level, which is add in instant rewards and coupons and start giving people money back um, in real time. So that kind of brings us to the end of um, the presentation, and hopefully um, that's just a bit of a scene setter for the guys that are going to follow, but hopefully after all of this, you'll agree with me that the drivers are definitely in place for um, up mass uptake of mobile and mobile internet. And the e-commerce is here, and we should definitely start thinking about it if we're a business that has a transactional um, format for our, our websites, etc. cetera, um, but it's still quite niche, um, so don't panic. Location is going to get more and more important, and it's definitely going to be an enabler for real-time marketing, which we've just discussed. But the most important trend of all, and the most powerful trend, uh, even though it's quite small at the moment, but it's going to be um, so beneficial to our businesses in the future, is this conver convergence between mobile, social, and location. So um, just before I go, I'm going to leave you with another two numbers. And this one I think is quite important for us all to think about. It's a bit of a reality check. Um, most people under 20 think the internet has always been there. And um, so you can only imagine if your business isn't uh, optimized for the mobile, if, you know, if that's, they'll, they just won't understand. So um, just have a, a think about that. And then finally, um, just to close, oops, if... Uh, after all this, you're still wondering whether to integrate uh, mobile into your marketing strategies, digital strategies even better, but best of all, your total business strategy, then um, the answer is 100% yes. So, 
so that's me. Um, I, I don't know if we're doing questions now or later. We'll have a discussion afterwards anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay.